I'm so excited to host and moderate this panel today. Thank you all for coming. Um, I have everybody's bios. I'll do quick bios, and then we'll just dig in and start asking questions. So Emily Losa Bush uh, is executive director of Arch Grants, uh, and in that role, she leads strategy, fund development, and day-to-day -day management for the St. Louis-based nonprofit. Uh, she got her bachelor's from Washington University in St. Louis and her MBA from DePaul University in Chicago. She's got both experience as a founder and um, a number of years experience in the nonprofit space. Um, I'm really excited to have her here today. Uh, Brian Hopcraft is an entrepreneur and technology leader with more than 25 years experience leading both established technology companies and startups. As managing director of Lewis and Clark Ventures, he's responsible for overseeing all aspects of the firm, including fund management, deal sourcing, and investments. Uh, prior to joining Lewis and Clark, he held leadership roles at both Answers and Sendouts, where he was CEO. And early in his career, he also is um, a founder. He founded a company called Simplified Workforce Solutions uh, that was acquired by 360 Commerce. Um, and then John True uh, is not what it says on the slide. I apologize for that. <laughs> um, he's a general I, partner. I do love bread, though. <laughs> yeah. And how do you slice your bagels? <laughs> no? <laughs> um, he is a general partner at Cultivation Capital and an active investor both uh, in St. Louis and beyond. Um, his most recent operational experience is as SV was as SVP of field operations for Guidewire. Um, and in the 20 years prior to Guidewire, he uh, held senior management positions at several category-defining early-stage tech companies, including Fortify, which was acquired by HP, Equilogic, acquired by Dell, Ariba, which was first public and then acquired by SAP, and PTC, which is publicly traded. So um, we are, I'm so happy to have all three of you on this panel. And as I was putting these notes together, I realized that all three of your organizations are um, seven years old or younger, which if you've been around the St. Louis ecosystem uh, for a while, says so much about sort of where we've come from and where we're going. Um, so thank you again for coming. I want to start off by asking um, if you can each tell us a little bit about what percentage of um, the portfolio companies um, or, or cohort companies um, are heavily geared toward AI, and if you're, what kind of changes you're seeing in terms of um, deal flow. Brian. Happy to start. Uh, yes, we're... Um, we have a portfolio of, I think, 16 uh, companies throughout the, primarily the middle of the country. As far as what percentage of our portfolio companies um, have an AI component, uh, it varies. I think it's probably around 60%. Some of our companies are focused e exclusively in the technology of uh, AI or ML is paramount to what they do. Big Squid is one of those. They're here today. They presented earlier. Um, so they would be foundational. And uh, But we have other companies that um, do not have much of an AI component based off of the, the uh, you know, the, the business problem that they're looking to solve. But, um, you know, deal flow we can talk about uh, quite a bit, I think, and there's probably some interesting stories we could tell about deal flow. So I'll save that answer for later. Yeah, for us, it's, um, so we have about, at this point, a little over 100 cohort companies that are um, still in operation, and about 10 to 15 cent percent would say that they are exclusively and, and very heavily an AI company. But again, uh, similar to what, what uh, Brian was saying, I think they're about 50 to 60 percent have some AI component. And seven of our past recipients are actually here presenting in some capacity today. So um, I think it, it speaks to what I know we're going to get into later, which is the prevalence of AI in how, how a lot of particularly early, early stage and startup companies are, are functioning generally. So first of all, for those of you that don't know about Arch Grants, you know, Brian and I are in the business of uh, making money by investing. Arch Grants is probably the most impactful seed stage program in, uh, in the area, and they get support from uh, private folks, from uh, public entities, and they're just doing a great job of impacting the start startup ecosystem. Really want to thank you very much for the work that you guys do. Uh, in terms of our portfolio, we, uh, we invest in three areas, uh, enterprise software, uh, ag tech and life sciences. Uh, I focus in the, the enterprise software area. Across the, uh, the entire three areas, I would say 60% or so. Um, the life sciences ones from the outside looking in tend to be either 
very focused on the impact of, of AI on solving problems or not at all in terms of drug research. In software, the area that, uh, uh, that I focus in, uh, I would say 60% of our current portfolio and 80% of the pitches that we see have some component. And we, we define the components kind of in escalating fashion. Some just have uh, what I would consider a, a recommendation engine using some form of AI, like, and, and then there's the next set which would make predictions uh, of outcomes, and the last would make predictions and take actions or a complete um, autonomous kind of a cycle. And we see more, it, it, less of autonomous, more in the middle, and even fewer, or um, even more at the bottom, just because of the complexity and the amount of capital and expertise that it takes. And uh, in terms of uh, deal flow, what you all have invested in, can you share um, maybe, maybe a, um, a good successful story or one that you've invested in, one that you thought, oh my gosh, that's crazy. Uh, where's the hype and where's the reality? He does all the crazy ones down there. <laughs> yeah, we do all, all the crazy ones. Yeah, I can tell you about a crazy one. I was uh, thinking through some of the ones that uh, have come to us. And so talking about deal flow, you, it's rare when a company comes to us that doesn't have some AI or machine learning component to what they do. And I think there's a FOMO or there's a, um, you know, there's a lot of hype around that. We'll talk about that. So I think for a company, they, they often feel like they have to uh, talk about that they have the latest technology. So one of the companies that we, we didn't invest in, but I think it's a great example of this, uh, trying to check all the boxes that an investor might be interested in. It was a company that we uh, saw last year or it came to us last year, and they uh, started with having... Um, uh, they would understand the genomics of your pet. They would create, um, thank you. Uh, so they understood the genomics of your pet to create customized pet food. Okay, that's interesting, and that's a whole huge category in it to you know unto it itself. Um, but then the pet food that they would create was uh, based on alternate proteins, like alternate proteins. That's a huge category within itself. They also had a connected uh, water bowl so that they could understand your pet's you know, consumption of uh, water. It also had a wearable so it could understand all of the biometrics of your pet. So those are both you know, Internet of Things and uh, wearables are big things. So they're checking all the boxes. Um, they also had insurance component in some way, which I don't really understand. So it checked the uh, insurance component too, and insurance is a huge thing in venture. Um, and then of course they couldn't leave AI out of it. They were, they were going to do AI when they were using all of those things to predict you know, future illness for your pet as well. So that's an example of, wow, they were really uh, hitting on all cylinders. And if they can pull all that off, that's wonderful. You know, I have more power to them. But um, you know, I think that's an example of let's, uh, uh, let's not miss out on something that's huge and something that might get the investor's interest. I think is one. Um, one of the companies we invested in that we're super excited about, it's a St. Louis company, it's called Benson Hill Biosystems, I'm sure the St. Louis folks would know of them. Uh, but what's interesting about what they're doing is uh, they take uh, trait data, genomic trait data for certain types of crops, um, and they combine that with AI, and they're, what they're trying to do is predict um, what traits uh, have certain characteristics for certain types of crops. So, you know, an example might be tomatoes. You go to the grocery store, the tomato looks great, it's not bruised, it's nice and red. You think, gosh, this is going to taste great. You take it home, it doesn't taste so great. Um, it would mean a lot to that industry if you could get that tomato through the supply chain but have it taste uh, wonderful and sweet. And so using Benson Hill and um, technology, that industry is trying to identify the traits, that they can get into the tomato in that example that will get it through the supply chain. It'll still look red, not bruised. It's going to taste great. And that'll mean a lot to their industry. So that's an interesting one that's based here in St. Louis that we're excited about. Yeah, for, I, I'm good. Good yeah. <laughs> um, for us, there's, so to, to the deal flow question, I think um, we were actually in response to this just looking because our applications are open right now. And so the team were looking every day at what's coming in. And so we did a little quick check and I would say the number of companies that have applied for Arch Grants this year have some component in the AI space has grown exponentially even just last year to this year and I'm, I'm sure prepare.ai can take some credit for that because a lot of our recipients came last year um, and a lot of people um, are hearing about about what's happening here and in different um, heartland cities in the AI space um, for us, one of the companies that we um, that are in our cohort that we we say we invested in, but um, as John rightly pointed out, it's a, it's a non-dilutive grant that we give. Um, last year was a company that specifically uses AI and um, uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning in the call center space, 
and helps people who are those salespeople or those representatives on the line in real time, um, giving them feedback on how the call is going, what they could do better, what they could do differently, allowing them to course correct as they go. Obviously has a, a lot of use um, for, for almost every industry, every business. And I think um, what's interesting about that is when you think about legacy companies um, in St. Louis and some of the companies that are doing things that have been done for a long time and how some of these AI startups can actually help them just do it better. It doesn't have to replace them, doesn't have to be something different. It's just how, how this is the next tool in their tool belt. I think, well, Emily talks about customer experience there. Uh, that's one of the areas that AI tends to, to have been deeply embedded already in, you know, how we re make recommendations, support, um, or advise our customers in, in general. Uh, we've got a really exciting one we're uh, just investing in that um, kind of goes under the social impact and uh, venture investing world called Be My Eyes. Uh, and, and Be My Eyes, uh, it, it, any business that's focused on artificial intelligence has to has, have a great and dense set of data to build off of, I guess, a corpus of data, as the data scientists say. Um, and BMAI started a business, and they created a nonprofit to begin with, with the largest network of sight of blind and sight-impaired people in the world. There are about 225 million sight-impaired, uh, somewhere around five or six million blind. Uh, and they provided a free service to begin with that whenever someone was having an issue, uh, whether it was in a hotel room trying to figure out the difference between a vodka bottle and a shampoo bottle, or, or whether they're trying to cook a meal and couldn't figure out what the ingredient was, uh, there's a volunteer network of folks they can immediately call, have a, um, a specialized video conference to lead them through that challenge. Well, it turns out that uh, after the business started, they realized that almost 30% of the calls were related to specific products, specifically IT products. The world has been digitized in front of our eyes in the last 10 years, and we've kind of left behind uh, a group of handicapped people to, uh, to make sure they're getting the benefits of that digitization. And so what they learned pretty quickly first is that the tool is very relevant to call centers. Uh, and uh, without any uh, marketing or salespeople, some of the largest call centers in the world, specifically Google, Apple, and Microsoft, uncovered them and said, uh, we understand you're taking calls about our products. Uh, we'd like to be able to support them in the same way you do. And so now they have about uh, two and a half million videos of folks helping um, blind folks through their day. And then a subset of those are, are product specific. And so now Microsoft, Google, and Apple, and Verizon uh, have all contracted to be able to take that data, to be able to label it and tag it appropriately, and then evaluate it and then drive future product design to better uh, serve blind and sight sight impaired folks. And so uh, the interesting thing, if you do the forensics of, a, uh, of an AI based company, you have to have a couple things. You have to have a great data set that's sustainable. Uh, you then have to have to have uh, algorithms and you have to have a real business outcome. And this is a business we're really excited about because we, we think we have a, a very differentiated set of all the all three of those over time to help companies of all kinds of consumer products uh, design their future products. Awesome. Uh, so a follow-up question to that is, how do you all vet your deals? I know, I don't think any of us are data scientists up here, uh, and the technology changes so quickly. How are you all each uh, you know, doing due diligence in a way that is responsible to your investors? Oh, I get to start with that one? <clears throat> uh, I think the answer is we're not data scientists, and we can't validate the data science uh, to that level. I think how we look at it at Lewis and Clark Ventures uh, is probably through the customer's eyes. So what's the problem the company is solving? Um, are they solving it with enough customers uh, that, you know, to validate that the, the product market fit might be at its early stage, but it's there? Um, you know, as far as what model they might be selecting and if they're um, doing that properly, uh, that's not something we're gonna be able to ascertain. But for us, it's the AI oftentimes isn't the lead, it's a component of their solution. And uh, you know, not their, their choice of how they're solving that wouldn't dictate you know, our, our go or no go decision on that. Um, but when it does have a high, a high um, AI or ML component, you know, we do try to get some third party validation of folks who you know, are a little smarter in that regard than we are uh, technically. Yeah, we take that third party validation even further where the, the best way that we do our due diligence is that we don't do it. Um, 
by design, we, every one of the companies that comes in, we get a whole, and we are obviously in a different position than, than these two guys um, in, ter in terms of what our criteria is, but we have people from around the community and around um, that are experts in this space come in and, and look at our companies. But I think to your point, you're right, is that to, to a large extent, we're looking at the, val the validity of the solution to the problem they're trying to solve, and then the, the general sense that the, the, the science works so that the data um, supports what they're saying, and then what with the companies that we're funding are at a very early stage. And so a lot of that remains to be seen at scale. No different. We very much uh, utilize third parties. We specifically have established personal uh, relationships with two other firms, one in uh, Silicon Valley called Bootstrap Labs and one in Boston called Glasswing that do nothing but AI and ML investing, and we uh, tend to lean on each other for advice uh, on deals that are heavy in, in those areas. I would say in terms of, of due diligence, uh, especially in the enterprise software area, we really focus um, on the business outcome that uh, the AI can deliver if executed effectively, and then we look at can they do that sustainably, meaning can they, do they have some unique way to gather data and continue to gather that data in a way that no one else can because the uh, algorithms, although they can be very special, ten tend to be pretty democratized and open sourced these days. And so uh, the, the data fueling uh, the solution is really, really important. And uh, how about differences that you're seeing between consumer products and B2B products? Are there any, you mentioned one, the pet one that is consumer targeted. Are you all seeing differences in those applications and is B2B further along than B2C? Any thoughts on that? The one thing I'll say, just because I had this conversation just last night with one of our recipients, is at the enterprise level, sometimes um, when you have a solution, particularly for the legacy companies I was talking about, um, it's harder, the pilots are a little bit harder to um, we're talking about a consumer product, you can have a test group and, and do that pretty quickly. But at an enterprise level, when you're talking about potentially in this, um, in this company's case, um, changing out major components of boilers in large, in large buildings, um, the, uh, the way that he said it, which I love, um, and I'm going to steal, I don't see him in here, so I'm going to steal it. Um, I do it anyway, but um, is that you're asking them, you're saying I can make your heart work better, but I have to take it out first and fix it and then put it back in. You're asking a lot of these of, of enterprises. And so I think what's, what we're seeing is that um, there's in some ways they're having to be a little bit more, and I know we're going to get to this iterative versus revolutionary, but they're having to be a little bit more iterative in how it's implemented because of the scale and because of the potential implications on enterprise level. I think uh, we do very little uh, consumer investing, so I'm not very knowledgeable other than there are obviously organizations that hold mass amounts of consumer data that have huge advantages like Amazon, like Google. On the enterprise side, um, I think there also is uh, a very much a counterintuitive evolution around AI and ML as it relates to uh, innovation, early stage technology in the past. Uh, quite frankly, enterprises were very poor at innovation in general, and uh, startups move much more uh, uh, quickly and nimbly to come up with innovative solutions, and they get bought by larger companies to fill, to fill holes. Because of the foundation of AI, uh, data is so important, and because large enterprises own so much critical data already, I think two things you're going to see. One is you're going to see some, some of the very large enterprises be the leaders in AI and ML. I think you saw Intel as an example of that. Uh, you're also going to see, um, I think as a general rule, some, some of the resurgence of corporate uh, venture practices who in the past have not been all that successful and they tend to come and go as, um, as kind of the, the bubbles burst in the investment world. And I think this is going to be a new resurgence for the corporate venture arms because they're going to come to the venture arm with sets of data and then look for small companies to help augment that data with real business solutions. So I think, um, I think that's going to be a really important trend as we move forward. And I think we see that at Jane in terms of investing that, you know, there are a lot of um, enterprise venture funds that are interested in getting in to these early stage companies. So um, what about, you know, so I get a rundown from our PR agency 
every day uh, on AI related articles that are published um, from you know equally rep reputable media outlets you can get uh, almost completely conflicting headlines in, in a single day. Um, so you know where are we in the uh, in the sort of life cycle? Are we in the trough of disillusionment, as Gardner would put it, or uh, are we not even there yet? Are we past it? Uh, you know, I there are, there are some new trends in technology that are um, kind of unidimensional that have the kind of the one cycle of what you'll consider the hype cycle or crossing the chasm or whatever latest analogy you want to use. I view uh, AI and ML and neural networks or whatever you want to call all these AI things um, as much more ubiquitous uh, to all business solutions going forward. I, I kind of make analogous a little bit to how cybersecurity worked early. And if you, if you go back, cybersecurity was really just invented in the early 2000s. And I remember speaking to uh, Excel, which is one of the top 10 venture firms in the world, and in 2009, right as the bubble burst after eight, it was kind of like, how are you thinking about cybersecurity? It's like, and these are the smartest people in the world. Oh my goodness, last year there were 2,000 cybersecurity companies invested. 90% of them are going to die. Uh, we think that the bubble has burst in cybersecurity, and, um, and we really um, are looking for the next wave of, of investment. And as we all know, the next eight years were the most prosperous for cybersecurity investing in the world, and that was driven by really rapid cycle times of new products, really quickly changing um, uh, enemies on the other side trying to do weird things to us. Um, and I think uh, AI is in a similar boat. I think we're, we're definitely at the, at the top of an investment cycle uh, where, I don't know, the number in 17 was roughly uh, 13 billion invested in startup or mid-stage companies and the number's gonna be bigger in 18. I do think we're gonna go through a down period. Um, uh, you can call it disillusionment, but there'll be a whole set of folks that aren't able to establish differentiation over time with their data. And those are gonna, um, I think, fail. They're gonna die pretty miserably. And there'll be a slowdown in investment, but then we'll pick up in the future. But then the second piece of that is the value, along with that hype, valuations have gone, uh, have, have, have gone really crazy. And so I think you'll see many companies that are really good are gonna get into a valuation crunch where they won't be able to raise money um, without significant down rounds, and those will drive uh, some aqua hires and lower priced uh, acquisitions by big corporates. Uh, so I, I'm very bullish that 10 years from now, uh, we're still gonna be very, very active. Everyone's gonna be active in new solutions in this area, but we'll have some ups and downs. Yeah, I think those uh, great points. You know, a couple of the, the numbers that I looked at recently as far as um, investment in AI companies, I think over the last five years, uh, if you go back five years ago, there was something like 200 companies that were AI related or had AI in their name. Uh, last year, there was something like 1,800 companies that were funded, you know, that were AI related. So it just shows you the scale. And then as John was pointing out, valuations, you know, are uh, creeping up as well. So uh, some of the information that we saw suggests that, uh, you know, a, a a stage round a uh, number of years ago versus today in AI um, is almost doubled. And so, you know, these companies are getting a premium um, and it's, it's a testament to the, to the hype cycle. Um, but I think the, uh, my take on where we are is it probably depends too on the different um, elements of or segments of AI. You know, maybe autonomous vehicles might be in the trough of this, you know, disillusionment or whatever it's called. But there's, you know, AI is so prevalent today. And I think of it also compared to, um, you know, the last big trend that we all were talking about, which was blockchain. You know, is anybody talking about blockchain anymore? Uh, no. Um, I don't think AI is going to have that same uh, trough that, you know, that's that um, uh, severe because it's so prevalent in our lives already in so many ways. And uh, if there is a dip, you know, it'll be short term and keep going. Like some of the slides that David had on earlier today of where this is going, they just kept getting bigger. I think that's probably the case. Uh so I know, you know, Brian and John, you're both, oh, we already talked about that, sorry. <laughs> um, so are the companies that you all are investing in making incremental changes um, or are they making, you know, revolutionary changes, leaps and bounds? And where are you seeing investments uh, really strike the right balance of uh, success for investors? take a stab at that one, I guess. Um, 
I think it's probably more incremental, you know, quite honestly. I think what, um, going back to one of my comments earlier, you know, we're look, we invest in companies that are solving a business problem or multiple problems. AI is typically a component of that. Um, it, it, they're probably not doing it in a way that's so revolutionary, but it is, you know, can be a, a critical feature in how they're solving it. So it tends to be an important component. Um, you know, every once in a while we see companies that are a little more um, foundational. You know, we have one that I mentioned that was here called Big Squid. It's automated machine learning and um, AI. And so the, you know, the value proposition there is you don't have a team of data scientists and you want to empower your analysts to do more data science. Um, they help you do that. And I think, you know, that could be viewed as incremental, but it's going to be foundational to a company that couldn't do data science before uh, big, using Big Squid and now can. Um, but I think it, very, it really varies. Yeah, I would, I would definitely agree on um, tending toward incremental um, and part of it just being, I think that because, um, as John was saying, that because AI is so ubiquitous, it's not one area where you can see these big jumps happening. I think it's going to become, it's not going to be long before every element of companies, we don't, we don't even think about what percentage of our portfolio has AI components because most of them in one way or another will or does probably already. Um, and so I think that the changes are happening. Um, I think, I can't imagine there being like a, a huge jump where there's, this is the date of the revolution. Um, but I, I am willing to be proven wrong on that. Um, but I think generally it's as we continue to, to change and then ad adoption is going to be the key. And so that by its nature is incremental because as more and more companies start to use this, then it just becomes more commonplace. We all tell a story, tell a story of a company we're uh, working with right now called Snapsheet. Uh, that is kind of, it, it's both evolutionary and revolutionary. I think its journey kind of uh, can be um, kind of parallel to how a lot of companies are going to evolve. Snapsheet got started trying to solve a simple problem and not really technology based. Uh, they were in the business of trying to uh, make auto claims go faster. So when you have a fender bender or an auto accident. And so they started by having an outsourced set of folks that uh, would show up when you had an auto accident and they were hired by the big insurance companies nationwide or progressive. And they, their value proposition was they could do it faster, better, cheaper than the company themselves. And they did that because they could hire people better, they could keep them busier. They didn't have these, um, uh, these big surges in, uh, in activity where they needed people that weren't um, equipped yet. So they started that business and then started to develop software uh, that was based on AI to start to learn the patterns that you would use, especially around recognition of images, of pictures you take of, um, of accidents. And so, uh, they start do, doing this for their internal use, and it turns out um, this was an amazing stat for me, but it took six years for their algorithms to learn how to do the job 80% as good as their own humans could. It took one year to close the gap from 80 to 100% so the, the algorithm could actually do it as well as a human. Then it took six months, and the algorithm was doing it twice as fast uh, as the humans were. And so it took six years then six months, then, or then one year, then six months. And so I think that kind of evolution of data and learning and efficiency is not going to be unusual in these, uh, in these big data sets. Then the second thing um, about that story that's really interesting for us as investors is it, it's been, in general, um, kind of a red flag when a service, the professional services company in general, and it happens all the time, they want to take their knowledge that they're learning in their professional service, whatever it may be, almost always consulting of some sort, and they want to develop uh, a software product that kind of replicates the knowledge that they get and the domain expertise that they have. And uh, most venture firms really shy away from those because uh, people that um, make and market products do it very differently than the way they make and market services. AI and machine learning, I think, is going to bring a whole new generation of services companies that are able to take data that they own that's differentiated that they can continue to get very uniquely and then apply these, uh, these models to it and potentially be successful technology companies. I'm not sure yet, but we've seen several that are making really good progress here. All right. Uh, so, you know, we have heard a lot about ethics at this conference. Tony talked about it in his keynote this morning. What responsibility, if any, do investors have uh, to ensure that the companies they're investing in are acting responsibly uh, with the data that they're capturing? 
you know, I think one of the ways that we as investors are responsible or can help with that is to make sure that there's good governance and that you're asking the question and that they're thinking through that. And that applies to a number of things, but it, you know, it's certainly applied. Are they thinking through the ethical implications of the AI and their approaches and the machine learning and the data sets and what biases might be in there? So I think it's, you know, it's up to us to ask those questions and to, uh, as board members, to challenge the companies that we invest in to make sure that they are thinking through these things and that there's not, um, you know, a challenge that that'll ultimately face or a bias that uh, otherwise derails them later on. You know, I I tend to think that uh, alignment is great, and investors are definitely aligned in creating, helping the founding team create value. And it's clear that um, not today, not being careful about how you use or how your data is used or how. Um, segregated and or um, uh, patterns can um, drive human biases into the data is really important and it'll drive down enterprise value over time. So I think you'll see informed investors be very active because it definitely is, uh, is in line with value created in the company. Uh, this will be my last question and then we'll open it up to the room if Julia Marcus, if you want to help with mics. Uh, so you know, in your all's view, what's next? What are we going to be talking about at Prepare 2024? Yeah, so I think um, it's an interesting question from the perspective of what I mentioned before is that it's not so much about um, how much AI or how does it, how, but it's how is AI influencing um, all of the all of the companies that we are investing in, and then also the customers, the enterprise or consumer customers that they are um, that they are interacting with. So I think that ethics question is going to be um, something that only grows in importance. And I think some of the ethical questions that we are conti that continue to surface are going to do so even more so in the next five years um, as um, prevalence of this grows, and then. Um, yeah, I mean, I think those, and then generally, as we think about the the partnership between a legacy business, a legacy industry, and what's happening in AI, how to bridge those gaps, I think is something that I think a lot of the companies here and the people here are probably already thinking about and talking about, but the people who are by design, probably not, not by design, but just are not here because they don't see this as pertaining to them, are more of the people that I think we're going to have to bring into the fold. Yeah, I think um, very similarly to what you just said, there's going to be, it'll be much more mainstream. And I think, you know, your, this conference, for example, will probably be, uh, you know, five or ten times as big, right? Because of the uh, organizations and institutions who are just now trying to do some things with data science are going to be so much more evolved. Um, and they'll just be more, uh, more prevalent. It'll be more common. Um, I think that'll be a big driver of, um, of this conference and of uh, the future. Even though I'm not knowledgeable on it at all, I invest in software. I think uh, five years from now, even though uh, kind of automated vehicles have taken the spotlight in terms of where a lot of the money has been invested, the big checks, I think five years from now, we're going to look back and realize that uh, healthcare and personal healthcare is going to be uh, just tremendously revolutionized. Uh, it, I mean, the whole, the whole practice of all of our medical professionals taking small pieces of data from their own patients to make diagnosis and recommendations on treatments is just going to dramatically change as we democratize the data and then run algorithms on it. So I can't wait because my health is deteriorating very quickly. <laughs> uh, questions from the audience? We've got two mics here so that everyone can hear you. Anyone? I hope this makes sense because I work for a much more mature uh, established organization that I assume you are are interacting with on a day-to-day -day basis, but I'm curious as to I, how, when, when you're hearing a proposal or a pitch, you're walking through a business plan with someone that's applying for funding or for a grant, like what sort of, you were talking about check of the box earlier, right? What, what are some of those sort of softer elements that you look for in the people uh, or, or in the mission or things like that that get you excited above and beyond just the technology itself? Um, I'm one that doesn't get too excited about technology in general because we see all the time where the best technology doesn't doesn't win so we're almost always whether it's AI or anything else evaluating the team above all else and uh, we look at the team on a couple very important dimensions but one is just core entrepreneurial 
spirit, conviction, determina determination, perseverance, and a passion for the problem they're trying to solve. But more specifically to, uh, to your question, and I think in order to be successful uh, in an AI-only business, you really have to have some deep domain expertise around the problem that you're trying to, trying to solve. I'll give you an example of a recent investment that we made um, in the area of construction technology where this is, uh, is exactly the case. The name of the company is Reconstruct, and it comes out of research at the University of Illinois, um, and it's AI around large construction projects. And so the founder um, is someone that uh, was an executive with three large construction projects, then went into uh, university as a PhD and did research on um, how do we do a 4D representation um, of all major construction projects? And so um, if you think about, uh, let's say, the new Centene building, which one is one of the largest going on in town, today, when you, if you go by there during the day, very unusual versus what you would have seen five years ago, you'll see the crane, and on the crane will be a 360 camera. And then um, if you catch it at the right time, two or three times during the day, there'll be drones flying around the outside of the building, and then you'll notice that a half a dozen or so people that walk into the building every day will have helmets on and there'll be cameras in front of the helmets. And so what all this uh, um, pictography, I guess you'll call it, is doing is, cr is creating um, what, it, what I'll call a TiVo for a construction project. And uh, what they do is they weave together, they knit together uh, everything about that project every day and then create um, an analysis, an AI algorithmic analysis that compares it against the project plan and against the cost plan, and then make recommendations on a daily basis about where they should adjust headcount and workflow, where they should adjust supply chain and materials, or worse yet, at the end of the project, if they have uh, liability issues, uh, how they should go back in time to confirm whether uh, that building was built uh, correctly or not. And the whole reason that's successful is not because the pictography is incredibly unique, even though it's cool, but there are lots of industries that are, do, that are, that are kind of weaving together a bunch of pictures into a video, but they're applying it with these rules along with the internal uh, business systems of the construction industry to re really reduce crop costs and drive on-time performance. So I think it's that kind of domain expertise that we look for in addition to that, uh, that entrepreneurial spirit. Yeah, the only thing I would add to that is uh, actually what the um, guy from Intel was just talking about before this is emotional intelligence um, is generally how I could best describe when you look, especially when it's something that is that science a lot of people are that a lot of people in the room, even if they are experts in the field, might not understand completely. It's how passionate entrepreneurial are you on this? How how invested are you in this? And um, how, how far are you willing to take this? Have you thought of all the angles? So it's asking those types of questions, which has a lot to do with the, the people behind them. And then all that gets to um, the idea of what's the problem you're trying to solve and how, how strategically have you thought through that more so than the, um, the mechanism to do it. Yeah, those are all great points and things we consider a lot too. And I think another thing on the team element is um, because of that self-awareness of, you know, we don't expect you to have all the answers and it's okay to say you don't know something. I think we see so many companies that come in and they think they have to have every answer and that's probably why they, you know, check an AI box because they want to make sure they're not missing something. So it's okay to say I don't know that. Here's what I think is the, you know, the future. Here's what I think the answer is. Um, but to have that self-awareness around, you know, the team, uh, you, whatever the question is and, you know, the, the, to be able to answer, for example, how does the team going to evolve over time? You know, where we're trying to understand is have you evaluated the team? Where are you missing um, skills? You know, what does that look like two or three net years ago or into the future once you've made our investment? So that self-awareness and domain expertise and all the things they were talking about, um, very critical. So uh, first of all, thank you all for coming out today. Um, the work that you all are doing is very meaningful. Like for us to replant in this city great startups, uh, we need the investment dollars of places like Arch Grants and Lewis and Clark and the fine work of Panera. That was a joke. Uh, but I, I guess my, my question would be, uh, from your perspective, what else can we be doing to make sure that St. Louis is leading in the AI revolution and not falling behind? Uh, this conference is obviously uh, one step in that direction, but yeah, I would love to hear from all, all of you on uh, how you think St. Louis can continue to lead in this area. Thank you. 
So my response to that actually has to do with what um, I am pushing um, on, on all of the people that support Arch Grants, and so many people in this community do, so many organizations, so many corporations do. It gets back to what I was talking about earlier, which is we are known for being very welcoming here um, and being very willing to take the meeting and willing to um, hear what an entrepreneur has to say and provide advice and provide mentorship. But a lot of times it comes down to proof of concept. And so to the extent that corporations um, or, I mean, individuals or uh, different companies that are here or that do business here are willing to give some of this a try, um, do a pilot, even consider doing something like that and really kind of put, uh, walk the walk with these entrepreneurs. Um, it's just going to continue to help, I mean, selfishly help our case when we're trying to get entrepreneurs to move here to do these types of things to say, to be able to say not only will you receive this $50,000 grant and all these um, network connections, but we have proven examples of where pilots have are happening here or where we have entrepreneurs who have done that. So that's, that's a big thing is, is that the more that we as a region can embrace not just AI, but generally an innovation, uh, innovative and um, kind of disruptive mindset, the, the more that we're going to stand out. Uh, so David, this is an example. Thank you very much of, uh, for helping with uh, this conference. This is an example of the kinds of things that have great leverage to hopefully help sustain um, uh, a good AI community in town. I think uh, the one area that we need to focus on, in my opinion, is uh, talent. And uh, it's the most difficult thing to focus on uh, because it's the most scarce and we're in an almost zero unemployment environment and there are a few sets of skills. Uh, coding being one, we have several initiatives in town. David, you're involved in one with uh, underprivileged kids. Jim McKelvey has, um, uh, has, has a nice one. Um, around coding, and I think uh, we need to follow that lead uh, in two areas. Uh, one in cybersecurity, where there's a tremendous uh, dearth of expertise and lots of great high-paying jobs if we give them some basic skills. And then the second is around uh, data science in addition to coding. I know one thing we're just, uh, we've just kicked off is uh, at T-Rex downtown is uh, uh, University of Missouri at, at Raleigh, ms and and WashU are both um, bringing in classrooms uh, to teach remotely uh, and try to recruit startups and folks that are working in startups to, to attend classes remotely in these kind of highly critical, high demand areas. Um, but I think programs like that, any of us in this room, if you have the initiative, um, jump on board. It's very rewarding. You can create a great network of very talented professionals. You can help connect them to opportunities in town and increase your own skills. Uh, and that's how these things happen. You know, it's, uh, it's David and his partner Chris creating a, a whole program for underprivileged kids to learn how to code. It's, it's Jim McKelvey saying, I'm, I'm not going to let the startups fail because not enough development talent. So it's up to, it's up to all of us in the, in the room, and I think there's great examples to, uh, to follow. Yeah, I think um, I would maybe add that the, the St. Louis has a lot going for it. You know, we have the, the luxury of going throughout the middle of the country and seeing all the other cities that are all trying to do similar things of helping early stage companies. Uh, and there, there are vast differences across the middle of the country. And I think St. Louis stands pretty tall in the collaborativeness, uh, in, inclusiveness. Um, there's a number of things that we're doing, and I think it's, you got to keep doing those things. And it's easy to say we're not as far along as we'd like to be, but um, you know, for somebody who sees a lot throughout the country, um, yeah, we're not um, we're not Austin, Texas yet. We're not San Francisco yet, but we're certainly not a lot of the other Midwestern cities who look at us and say, you know, someday we'll be like St. Louis. Um, and I think it's that it's all the things that the collaborative nature here is is what's unique. When folks come in from out of town and move their companies here or move here, I think that's something that's really um, strikes them. And I think that is keep doing that. Good things will happen. Um, you know, keep our heads down and keep focused on that. And David, maybe related to your question, but maybe on a more macro scale, how do we as a country um, continue to lead the innovation in AI and ML uh, going forward? Because I think uh, for the first time, we're at risk of not winning a technological race. Um, and it's driven by some things that we can change. So I'm, I won't talk politics, but I'll talk uh, the impact on the, the macro uh, government environment. So if you look at the amount of money that's been invested, um, 
Uh, the U.S. is number one and number two is China, but China is rapidly accelerating past us, and the, the Chinese government uh, has stated they, they want to be number one in the world in innovation around a, a AI, ML, and neural networks. And the reason, well, two reasons. One, they've typically been fast followers and stealers of our technology. Companies like Alibaba would wait for a business model or a technology to, technology to succeed. They'd copy it in, um, in China where there are a bunch of restrictions that don't allow outside companies to be successful. In this case, um, China has a, hu a, a unique advantage in that they own and drive consistency amongst the corpus of data around their people. All the data around um, the Chinese uh, civilians is owned by the government. And so they have tremendous fuel to drive great advances in, um, in AI, especially around healthcare, but anything that's related uh, to data and characteristics of, of people. And I think uh, we as a, uh, as a country have to work on data privacy really quickly to catch up to Europe and then have to start to work on sharing some of the very most important information, especially around uh, personal health care, so we can uh, stay up to and win uh, the technological battle, or else we'll be uh, using Chinese AI solutions uh, 10 years from now. So I'm hopeful that's not what we're talking about. So John, you mentioned healthcare as the next space for AI to really have a, a potential big impact, but I would love to hear from Brian and Emily, uh, which industries you see being the next opportunity for AI to really revolutionize uh, the human, human beings? Sure. Um, yeah, well, healthcare, absolutely. I think the other one that we do uh, some work in is agriculture, you know, plant sciences. You know, I mentioned um, what Benson Hill's doing, uh, but there's a lot of interesting things. The problem sets are big. You know, everybody eats, uh, you know, so the, the, um, uh, the solution set and the problem set are huge. And I think, you know, healthcare is very similar in, uh, to ag tech in that the digital revolution is probably, you know, that hit other industries 10, 15 years ago, you know, for a variety of reasons is really still just hitting those two industries. And I think there's a lot of parallels to where they are and where they will be, um, and that we can see a lot of change going forward. Yeah, I would, I would reiterate definitely healthcare um, and generally just well, I mean, the way that's just because of a number of issues that have been discussed here today that are converging that make that something that is something that we need to be focusing on. Um, and I would say in the consumer space um, where this may be more already um, more advanced than it is in others, I think we're going to the way that we work, through, I mean, the, the theme of this conference, the way that we work, live, play um, is all are, are, are ways that we are as consumers getting more and more comfortable with with adopting um, AI into into our in our to our daily lives. Um, so, how has AI affected you as an investor, and what tools have you used? I think it's a very insightful question. Um, the venture business uh, is a, a unique combination of art and science of uh, kind of trying to judge the characteristics of people and then to evaluate the, the business idea. Um, uh, I, I believe that some of the most advanced venture firms in the, in the country are already uh, using some very specific um, uh, AI solutions to especially look at deal flow to, take, to scrape the internet and look for lots of signs, both socially and um, business progress. Uh, we're partnered with one right now on a deal, and they've given us the opportunity to, to look at, at uh, uh, the solution that they've developed for themselves. And uh, I, I also think five years from now that all of us will be using, um, using tools like that to, to at least get access to a larger group of companies and make some decisions, at least at the first level, um, of kind of discrimination before we dig in with the, with the human touch. But I think it's a very insightful question, and our industry is, is ripe to be um, transformed or disintermediated by data. I think the same thing. I think today, you know, relatively little, but the future certainly um, will will be much more impacted, on, at least on the venture side of things. And when you think about our business, when you get uh, an investment right, it's a huge winner. And when you get one wrong, you know, it's a real um, drag on your time and your returns and all those things. So if you could use AI or ML, you know, approaches to try to help you identify the things that maybe you didn't see before in some of those patterns, it's, the payoff's huge. So I think that will, uh, that will eventually be here. And I think you're right, there are some fun, uh, funds that are using that today as well. So more to come. Sindhu, do we have time for one more? 
Okay, yeah, we have time for one more, especially if it's pretty. <laughs> Thank you, Cindy. Uh, since uh, AI is already changing uh, the definition as well as a character of future of work, that is work as well as workforce, so looking at the future of work as well as workforce, what are the things that either you are trying to do or you are seeing companies trying to do in terms of ensuring that there is a pipeline of uh, talents coming all the way from K, K, to th K through 12 to uh, the higher education. Higher education, I'm not too much worried about. It's the K through 12 is the part that I worry about a little bit more. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a, it's a really good question, and I think it, um, part of it is coming, it will, has to just start, as you said, in K through 12, closer to K than 12, um, and just building this into curriculum. Um, and the nice thing about, particularly on the consumer side, a lot of what we're talking about, that generation of kids is just gonna be more um, used to using from the time that they're very young, and so the, the transition between understanding that you use AI all the time and what you're doing to how that is going to impact your, your life and how you can build that and build on that, I think is something that will be really exciting as you think about what, what kids will be interested in. Then what, what we need to make sure that we're doing is within either school or non-school programs, um, building in the tools that, that kids are understanding the, the background of how that's working. And I think the, the coding kind of what has happened with that in the last 10 years or so has been a really good um, uh, test case for what it could look like um, to build this in, into curriculum for younger kids. Um, but absolutely, it's gonna be, gonna be really important. And I think companies will have to continue to build that in as, um, as David's doing, as others are doing, as trying to think about how, who are the next people who are gonna innovate and create for us um, startups are pretty good at doing that, so there's a lot of opportunity there. Um, so your question was around uh, developing talent, you said specifically between um, in the younger ages, and, uh, and so I, I think you're starting to see some early programs pop up where we introduce kids to coding in particular early on. Um, probably not the only one with this opinion, but maybe a little controversial, is that I'm a believer that uh, how we educate um, has to change dramatically over the next decade in the US for us to stay up, especially from a technology perspective, and that um, and then not just uh, grade school or secondary school or university. Got it. Or university programs where maybe the, the, the least valuable in that um, you, you, know, you come out of a, a four-year education with uh, lots of debt oftentimes and skills that are not useful five years later. And so I think there are many companies, tech, um, kind of new startup companies that are trying to address this. One's called Treehouse, uh, which is uh, producing you know, short, uh, uh, very snippets of curricula around very critical areas for different age groups. Um, but I think all of us in our student life and our career life are going to have to continue to reinvent ourselves much faster than we ever have before. And so how we think about it, education as a journey, a true customer career journey versus um, an event in time is going to be really important. AI and cybersecurity tend to be two of the hot topics right now, but I think those will be different a decade from now. But the cycle of change is going to get faster, not slower, and we have to adapt to make our educational cycles uh, faster, not slower, in, in my humble opinion. I think we'll leave it with that. I will say uh, I was driving my kids around over the weekend, and uh, one of my four-year-olds said, Siri was directing us to a party um, in a place I'd never been, and, and he said, Mommy, does that robot know everything? And I said, not yet. <laughs> but, well, thank you all so much for coming. We really appreciate it. And... Thanks.